Welcome to Silicon Bytes, fourth edition. In a momentous week, that saw Biden turn up in Kiev and saw the propagandists in Moscow lose their minds. Now, there's been so much coverage about Biden's visit that actually we're going to talk more about some of the stories that you may not have noticed during the week. But we will, of course, be posting some of the numerous memes that have been created over the course of Biden's visit and a reaction to his walkabout in central Kiev, especially as the air raid sirens were going off in the background. Of course, the symbolism of his visit cannot be understated. And there are many articles about that that can easily be found by Russian experts and the mainstream press. And this, of course, coincides with the year anniversary of the war. And it's seen a huge outpouring of specialist articles and mainstream news on the war in Kiev, and especially content that analyzes the course of events over the last 12 months. But before we dive into some articles in detail, let's look at some of the more interesting news stories that we've spotted in the press around the world this week. The first is from the Moscow Times, and it's about Russia's planned coup in Moldova. And the headline reminds us why Ukraine must win this war. It reminds us that Russia is still able to cause problems, not just in its immediate sphere of influence, but all over Europe and around the world, and still has malicious intent to do so. The article reads, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has announced that Ukrainian intelligence has intercepted a Russian plan to topple the pro-Western government in neighbouring Moldova. And it's a reminder, too, that Russia is not just waging a physical war, but continues to lead the field in hybrid warfare and influence operations. Now, recently, in the last edition of Silicon Bytes, we covered the story that Moldova has been plunged into a political crisis following the prime minister's resignation and the collapse of her government. On top of that, she has now revealed further details of the alleged plot which she said entailed the use of foreign actors with military backgrounds camouflaged in civilian clothes who were charged to undertake violent actions and attacks on state institutions, including the taking of hostages. Now, whether that operation comes to pass or not, it's clear that Russia sees the toppling of the Moldovan government as part of its wider strategy to exert influence in the region and possibly to distract from its failures in Ukraine. And another story released in the Moscow Times, dated the 17th of February, but has been very much backed up by Putin's speech yesterday, his State of the Union speech, is that Putin is stealing Russia for a long conflict and labelling it an existential war. What does this actually mean? Now, political analysts and sociologists say that one year after President ordered his troops into Ukraine, the Kremlin is putting society onto a war footing, and that includes the economy and heavy industry, and digging in for a years-long conflict. It's clear what he thinks he can achieve here. He believes he can outlast the West. He believes that his industry will be able to outproduce the West in terms of munitions, and its commitment to the war, and it seems that he's tooling up the Russian economy into a war economy. That includes the psychological space as well, tuning the education system, the media environment, uh, to make people understand that this is now the new normal. Sociologist Grigory Yudin said the Kremlin was preparing Russians for a major existential war, and the education system was being leveraged to meet that goal. Now, if you haven't seen it yet, Vlad Vexler has done a fantastic YouTube video on this topic, and he has dissected Putin's State of the Union address. And really, his primary takeaway from that is that war is the new normal for the Russian Federation, and war is the only thing that can keep Vladimir Putin in power in the Kremlin. And the final story we're going to look at from the Moscow Times today is about the preparation of a database of Russians eligible for military recruitment. The story dated the 18th of February of this year says that the Russian authorities have created a digital database of citizens who are eligible to be drafted into the military. Now, there are rumors of a second mobilization, 
but it's just as likely that there will now be rolling mobilization as Russia needs to top up its troop numbers at the front. The database will reportedly contain information about Russian citizens gathered from the country's Central Election Commission, the Ministry of Internal Affairs, the Health Ministry, the Federal Tax Services, and others. The data will also include the address at which each individual is registered, driver's license information, phone numbers, and email addresses, data on each individual's employment, health history, the report said. Now, for those who aren't aware, uh, Russia has a system called Propiska as well, which is like an internal passport. It means that you cannot access any health services. You cannot even buy a train ticket or do really anything without showing some form of official ID. The implications of this are that the central database will mean that someone eligible for military recruitment will not be able to live and function in society, will not be able to travel around if they're hoping not to be picked up by the recruitment officers and have their movements registered. As we saw in the first round of recruitment, people can actually be grabbed from their place of work, from underground stations, from on the street, or in any official building as they try to conduct their business. It means that if you want to avoid the draft, you have to either go underground, become invisible, or leave the country. The next story is from The Economist, and really it's something that doesn't get nearly enough attention. Now we have a great interview with Paul Nyland on the channel, uh, who actually set up the first charity to help Ukrainian soldiers suffering with PTSD. But this story in The Economist uh, goes into this topic in more detail and claims that thousands of Ukrainian soldiers are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. That, of course, is not surprising because many hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians uh, have now had exposure and experience at the front lines, and it must be a terrifying ordeal. In Ukraine, a treatment center has been set up. Its location is secret, but it is located somewhere in the Kharkiv province in Ukraine's northeast. Soldiers arriving or departing from what is the country's only military rehabilitation center dedicated to post-traumatic stress disorder do so in civilian clothing so as not to draw attention to the facility. The article claims that every week around 100 soldiers arrive for treatment, suffering from the full range of battlefield trauma symptoms, from sleeplessness and nightmares to flashbacks and crushing feeling of guilt at having survived when so many of their friends and comrades have not. And now three articles from the Financial Times. Their report on the Munich Security Conference and describe how it's charting a new role after uninviting Russia and Syria to the forum. It also provides a poignant historic echo because it was at the Munich Security Conference in 2007 that Putin gave his much quoted speech that outlined the new Russian aggression on the world stage and a warning to the West that Russia was back. The FT also continues with a number of other interesting stories. One of these, again, quite a small one, but talks about how the Ukrainian war is pushing the US to review its arms stockpiles. It's also reviewing its manufacturing capability and it's believed ramping up significantly the production of artillery shells and other munitions that are being used in Ukraine on the front at a prodigious pace. Finally, another piece that caught my eye from the Financial Times was the story that Switzerland is ruling out confiscating Russian assets over the Ukrainian war. Now, we know this is part of the MO of Switzerland. Uh, this news should not come as a surprise or a shock to anybody, but I do find it deeply immoral and worrying that they would take this stance. But it's likely that it's not Switzerland alone. And I think a process must begin of logging Russian assets around the world and a concerted effort taken to impound those where possible and put in place the legal frameworks for that money to be used for the construction, reconstruction of Ukraine and as part of the essential reparations for Russia's genocidal, destructive war. And finally, I'm going to take a headline from TV Rain. This is an article from a week ago, but this story has been developing throughout the week, and it's interesting to see that they called it out early. The article asks, 
What is Putin preparing for the 24th of February, the 12 month anniversary of the full scale war in Ukraine? It has to be pointed out, of course, that this isn't the start of the war itself. Russia has been mounting offensive operations against Ukraine since 2014. So this is the anniversary of the scaling up of the war, the continuation of the war. And TV Rain describes a process whereby Russia seems to be amassing aviation equipment, uh, planes and munitions on its border. This must also be apparent to Western intelligence. And one would hope they're passing this information to Ukraine and some form of preparation is being made in order to counter what could be a terrible and spectacular strike by Russia to mark the anniversary. And we know that Putin finds huge symbolism in anniversaries, in dates, and I'm sure he won't want this one to pass without marking it in blood in some horrific manner. And finally, the story on TV Rain is an interesting one, which has been developing all week. And that is the story that Prigozhin, the CEO of the criminal organization Wagner, has had the right to recruit soldiers from Russian prisons taken away from him. Now, this is a physical manifestation of a power struggle that seems to be developing. And this story actually has been building uh, day by day. And today I saw a fascinating piece uh, about how Prigozhin is now actively briefing against Gerasimov and the Russian army establishment. In response, it seems they have been denying Wagner forces munitions, and that has led to an uptick in the casualty rate and a significant number of mortalities on the Wagner side. Will Prigozhin take this lying down? Will he himself become a target now for one of the inexplicable assassinations that seem to have taken place amongst the Russian elite? Watch this space. Get your popcorn out. As a couple of commentators have pointed out, things are certainly getting ugly on the Russian side. Now we're going to look at three articles in depth. They're all interesting ones, I think, uh, which uh, certainly deserve a bit more attention. And of course, we're going to post links to these three articles in the description of the video. The first one is from the start of the month, and we uh, didn't cover it off in the first Silicon Bytes, but I think some of the follow-up I've seen on social media uh, certainly means that this is something we should dive into. And that is the question of who attacked the Nord Stream pipelines. So Mark Jacobs, writing in The Times on the 2nd of February, in what I think is an article which has a high degree of clickbait in its uh, titles, uh, as certainly they were trying to get the attention, I think, of the online audience, because there's no real new information in here. But it asked the question, who blew up the pipeline? And in a way that is perhaps a little more direct than previous articles, not only does it point the finger at Russia, it also suggests that the US, Russia and Britain could equally have been suspects in a kind of Agatha Christie type tone that the article is framed in. It starts by quoting Mikhail Podolyak, advisor to President Zelensky, who has very clearly blamed the Kremlin for the explosions. And for all those Vatniks who are claiming that Russia would have no reason to destroy its own pipeline, there are actually some very compelling reasons why they might do this. And of course, terrorist attacks on infrastructure are not unknown in the Russian playbook. And one of the strongest theories of why the Russians might have done this is that it could burn bridges with the West. It could be a message to the oligarchs and the others within Russia who are perhaps opposing Putin's war and hoping for a normalization of relations with the West. Destroying the pipeline is a signal to them to show them that resistance to the total war regime that Putin has implemented is useless and that there's no going back to how things were before. It's also extraordinary if we link this with the number of oil executives and senior businessmen within Russia who have been falling out of windows, etc., etc. Another theory, of course, is that Russia 
could have done this in order to try and divide the Western alliance. This was a key piece of European infrastructure. And one would have thought Russia might use this terrorist attack to divide the US from its European allies. Now, they seem to have made an attempt to do that. It hasn't been particularly successful. And one of the reasons why the West has been relatively silent on this crime could be that they don't want to bring division and disagreement amongst the allies to the surface and give that gift to Russia. The article, however, which goes through the details of the explosions, at least those scant details that are known about the explosions, does also hint at why the destruction of the pipeline may have been in the interests of the US. And the article quotes a number of Russian officials, as well as some commentators in the West, who point the finger of blame at the US. They highlight that, again, this is not an unknown tactic in the US playbook, if we go back a number of decades. And certainly, Britain and the US would have had the capacity to potentially carry out an attack like this. Some misplaced remarks by Biden are quoted here. And of course, the pipeline was a source of tension between the US and Germany and its European allies. The US did not approve this pipeline, did not approve of the dependency that it created of European countries on Russian hydrocarbons. The fact is, though, no new evidence is really detailed in the article. We don't know who blew up the pipeline. We may never know who did that, uh, either because the evidence is inconclusive or because the evidence may, of course, be suppressed. But watch this space. Hopefully we will find out more. And in the meantime, I think speculation with no new evidence actually can be dangerous here. And it could give a gift to Russian propagandists if we're not careful. The second article I want to dive into is actually written by one of my speakers on the channel, one of my guests on the channel from last week. And I highly recommend you watch that interview. Uh, a deeply fascinating and knowledgeable individual, Andrei Soldatov, uh, who writes many articles and books with Irina Baragan, uh, both uh, Russian exiles and academics. They are also experts on the Russian security industry, the Siloviki, the FSB, its culture and its operations. And this article is absolutely fascinating. It's published on the 27th of January, and it's titled Russia's Return to Gulag Economics. And it makes the case that far from thinking he's lost the war, Putin is actually gearing the Russian economy up for a long, hard slog. He's also preparing people from cradle to grave to get used to the idea that they're part of a militaristic society. And they are turning over more and more of the economy to war production, and one would assume away from any kind of consumer goods production. So retooling the factories and the minds of Russians suggest that Putin doesn't just have in mind 2023 or even 2024 for this operation to carry out. He may be thinking in terms of years or even moving to a frame of perpetual warfare, perpetual conflict on Russia's borders. And that, of course, is something that we should fear, but we should also plan for. We've also seen Wagner trawling Russian prisons for soldiers to top up its ranks at the front. Andrei also suggests a similar process may begin, where the government trawls prisons for semi-skilled and skilled workers to populate Russia's military industrial complex with new workers. One would assume as well that that is not workers on full wages, but a semi-slave population of workers. Hence the title of Gulag Economics. And it seems, according to Andrei, the Kremlin is not embarrassed about these historical echoes, echoes of the Stalin era, when the entire population were grist to the mill, material for the whims and caprices and irrational aims of Stalin's regime. Putin seems to be following in the tracks of the 1930s. 
That's a short but fascinating article, which I highly recommend you check out. And the last piece here. This is also written by one of my guests on the channel. It was posted on the 31st of January by Vasilina Orlova. And I highly recommend you look at the video recording of an interview with her. The audio and the video are not perfect, but I encourage you to stick with it because the content, the insights she gives are absolutely fascinating. Vasilina Orlova is an expert in the Russian mindset, in Russian culture. Vasilina Orlova writes very compellingly about decolonization, de-imperialization, democratization. And she's written an article where she examines the plans put forward by Gary Kasparov and Mikhail Khodorkovsky when they lay out their ambition for a future democratic Russia. Their article is called Don't Fear Putin's Demise, Victory for Ukraine, Democracy for Russia. And this article appeared in the Foreign Affairs magazine on January the 20th. Now, such an article, writes Vasilina, could not have been written before the full-blown Russian invasion. There are some oppositions in Russia who've moved quite radically and rapidly to a de-imperialization narrative and embracing ideas that would have been complete anathema to most Russians until relatively recently. But Vesselina picks out the ideas and the proposals in their article and unfortunately labels many of them as either fantastical or being the less likely outcome of a collapse of Putin's regime. She examines the phrase that Navalny's team use, which is a uh, beautiful Russia of the future, a very optimistic phrase, a very optimistic concept. And she suggests that actually that concept, which made sense last year, even made sense before Navalny was taken into custody upon his return to Russia. But now, while Russia is raising cities to the ground, while it's conducting fake referendums on the territory of Ukraine, where it's creating filtration camps on the territories that it occupies and committing violations of human rights on a vast scale. The idea of a beautiful Russia of the future is not only implausible, it is also to an extent tone deaf. Now, one idea laid out in the article, which she agrees with, and I think almost all commentators align with, is that Putin's regime is living on borrowed time. No one knows how it's going to end or exactly when it's going to end, but that end is becoming ever more likely as this disastrous war unfolds. And of course, as Ukraine snatches more victories from Russian defeat. If the West holds firm, then Putin's regime will collapse in the near future. But collapse is quite a dramatic statement there. It suggests a revolution of sorts. And I think that is what Kasparov and Khodorkovsky are hoping for. They are, of course, hoping that that collapse and the transformation that follows will be a liberal transformation from a rogue dictatorship into a parliamentary federal republic. As Vasilina points out, that may be the least likely outcome of the collapse in Putin's power and standing. Much more likely, and something for which there is a clear precedent, is that rather than some kind of popular uprising, rather than a revolution, which many Russians are still terrified of following the 1917 revolution, that still burns darkly, in people's memories, rather than a popular uprising for which there isn't really the groundswell or infrastructure or culture to allow that to happen. It's much more likely that actually there will be a transition of power to either a new Putin type figure, somebody who continues Putinism as a concept, or another form of strongman who may be more liberal, may be more open to change, but nonetheless not a full blown democratic transformation. But there's some far more interesting ideas that are also discussed in the article, and that is the stark choice that the successor of Putin will have to make. Putin's war and the dependencies it has created have moved Russia into the status of being a vassal of China, dependent on China, weak in terms of its relationship with the larger and richer country. And until recently, Putin may have met as an equal 
with Chinese statesmen. Now it's quite clear they are the junior partner in that relationship. And in fact, the weaker Russia gets and the more dependent it gets on China, then the more of a vassal master relationship may develop. But is that what Russians themselves want? Because the other choice is to turn its face back towards Europe, to seek further integration with the European economy. As unlikely as that seems at the moment, that may be a choice that many Russians feel far more comfortable with, or have the years of toxic propaganda poisoned Russians' minds to the idea that the West offers an alternative system, an alternative way of structuring their political institutions. But I think what Vasilina and Khodorkovsky agree on is that the West needs to arm Ukraine faster and with far more effective lethal equipment to push Russia fully out of its borders. Kasparov and Khodorkovsky make this case because it will hasten a revolution in Russia. Veselina, who has doubts about that, nonetheless says that it's equally important to arm Ukraine rapidly because to not do so would create a terrible precedent. That would create a new world order where the use of force, the use of arms to rewrite international borders would become the norm. And that is a Pandora's box that we should try to avoid at all costs. And the episode wouldn't be complete without a dive into the toxic clown world of Russian propaganda media. And here's an interesting one that ties up one of the stories we looked at earlier. One of the sources for the Times article about the destruction of Nord Stream was the formerly highly reputable journalist Seymour Hirsch, who in recent years has tended to be associated far more with conspiracy theories and with stories that seem to support Kremlin narratives. And he's just popped up in the thread of Margarita Simonyan, one of the key propagandists of Putin's regime. And apparently Seymour Hirsch has given an interview for her channel. No further details at the moment, um, but that is deeply concerning that he's been getting so much coverage in the Western press and now seems to be popping up on Russian propaganda channels. And some of you may have seen the extraordinarily tacky and hideous concert held in Moscow in support of the armed forces. It's another extraordinary spectacle of absolute tastelessness and cringe. And it seems most of the attendees were bussed in from the provinces and paid for their attendance at the rally. As Russia continues its descent into becoming a latter-day North Korea, expect to see more of these kind of rallies and concerts. Russian propaganda media has been losing its mind this week at the prospect of President Biden walking through the streets of Kiev. And of course, it was announced that American administration had actually given the Russians four hours notice prior to the visit to deconflict it. That means to warn them off firing any missiles at the city during President Biden's visit. Sensibly, they didn't do that, but it didn't stop Vladimir Solovyov from claiming that the Americans had asked permission for Biden to visit Kiev. That, of course, was not the case. And even some of the panellists on his show seem to find his claims highly implausible. And, of course, some of the propagandists are bemoaning the failure of the GOP heroes, as they call them, that they haven't yet brought Biden and his administration down, and they haven't yet managed to halt the provision of armaments and money to support the Ukrainian government and war effort. Now, if you haven't checked out Julia Davis's reports of uh, Russian Media Monitor, which can be found on Twitter and uh, on her excellent website, then I would definitely check that out. She is a sanctioned individual now, sanctioned by the Russian government, and she translates Russian propaganda broadcasts uh, and does it in an extremely humorous uh, and insightful way. I think that's all the time we want to spend in the toxic world of Russian propaganda. And that about wraps up this episode. But there is plenty more to talk about with the 12-month anniversary of the full-scale invasion coming up. We'll be putting out a special episode of Silicon Bytes 
on Friday evening UK time. So watch out for that.